Using Fritzing Advanced Level PCB View Next we'll look at PCB View In engineering, if you want something made, you needed a detailed engineering drawing with all the dimensions displayed on it. PCB View is that same engineering drawing, just simplified. In PCB view, you don't need the dimensions displayed because everything is drawn in a one-to-one -one scale so the objects themselves are their own dimensions. And that means the PCB view drawing has to be accurate and correct because it's going to be duplicated verbatim in manufacturing. I have to emphasize the accuracy required for the PCB view drawing because this is one view where close enough is not good enough. And this leads to the biggest problem you read about on the forum that people send out boards to be manufactured only to be disappointed when it comes back and parts don't fit. This is actually a common problem with most free EDAs because they allow people not experienced in engineering to make parts. Basically the public don't understand the significance of size and fit so they don't make parts that are accurate. The easiest way to check a PCB is printed out one to one and put parts on the drawing to see if the pins line up. You shouldn't have any problems with core parts like this IC or parts made by professional groups but anything with an unknown origin needs to be checked. We'll start with drawing traces. The default PCB is double sided and whenever you make a trace it always defaults to the top side which are shown as yellow traces. You can change the selected trace to the bottom side in Inspector. Sometimes you have to do it twice because of a bug. But if you want all subsequent traces to default to the bottom layer select bottom in the layers and from then on all traces will be on the bottom side bottom size traces are orange. Another way to get it to default to the bottom layer while keeping all layers active is select the PCB and select one layer single sided. You should notice the drawing change colour. If the drawing doesn't change colour you'll have to go double sided and single sided again. Fritzing sometimes glitches. Next is track width. If you click on a trace to select it you can adjust the width in inspector and the biggest complaint here is there's not enough selections of widths. What people don't realise is this is not just a drop down box and you can type in any value up to 128 thou for a track width. Another thing is the default track width is 24 thou but if you want to change them all at once you go routing, select all traces and in inspector you select your width. You can control click on traces you want to deselect before the change. Modern practices used on traces. Practically nobody uses 90 degree corners on traces anymore. It sends a reflected wave back in high frequency circuits, so it's preferable to use 45 degree corners. I personally don't use the following trace drawing shortcuts, but rather set the grid and snap the traces to snap points. You can kind of sense 45 degrees because the trace will run through the corners of the grid boxes and the course of the grid the easier it is to notice. Either way you might prefer these methods. If we have a trace in PCB view and we grab it, it can move anywhere. But if we hold the shift key down at the same time, it'll snap at 45 degree angles. To make a junction is the same as in schematic view. You can either pull a trace down from the pin to the bend point, or hold the alt key down while clicking on the bend point and dragging the trace to the pin. Then we grab the trace, hold the shift key down, and then move it until the horizontal bit looks straight. Then re-snap the junction. Bend points are made in the usual way, just double click on a line anywhere, or right click at bend point, or just grab it and move it. Alt click from the bend point to the pin and check connections. Moving parts. Again I just set grids and snap parts to grids but you might find these movements useful. Parts can also be moved by location coordinates but they can only move in steps, not exact numbers. We try to move this selected part by 1 thou but the number returns to what it was. We try 3 thou and the part moves. Shift also works on parts. If you hold the shift key down click on it and drag it around it will move in 45 degree angles. You can also move a part with arrow keys by clicking on it. And if you want to move 10 positions, it's shift arrow key. Parts can be rotated with a number, or if you grab them just right in the corner, you can rotate them manually. Sometimes you have a part on a part and you can't select the bottom part. Just right click on the part on top and send to the back. Another option is to select it in another view then just use the arrow keys to move it. Tips for laying out a PCB. You've finished your main view and you go to PCB view and all the parts are jumbled around. This is normal because no program can organize the parts in the correct positions. So you'll manually have to put them where you want them. The general rule is you put your biggest part in the middle and that way you've got access to all the pins around the outside. And apart from that there's not many more rules. 
If you like all your inputs and outputs on one side, you'd put the connector there. If you want inputs on one side and outputs on the other side, your LEDs at the top, buttons at the bottom, it's kind of up to you. But usually the position of the parts on the outside are dictated by the purpose of the pins of the part in the middle. Like if your MOSFET controller pins are on this side, you'd put your MOSFETs close to it. Another tip is, you'd keep your little individual circuits together. Like this is the power supply circuit directly off the 7805 linear regulator data sheet. So in PCB view, all the parts are clumped together. As far as connections go, you'd probably put solid traces between the parts of the little groups first, and then do the traces that join it to other groups. A tip for rat's nest lines is, you don't have to follow their direct routes. Like if we look at this rat's nest line, it wants to go straight to here. But let's say you're boxed in by traces. So you click on the pin, and that might show something closer, or a route that doesn't cross other traces. Like this one. The special buttons at the bottom of core bin for the PCB view are add another PCB. You can have more than one PCB in a sketch, but you can only select and export one at a time. Then we got the jumper wire. These are wire links to bridge over traces on single sided boards. These can be extended and rotated, but they're usually horizontal and vertical. I usually right click and hide part label because it gets in the way. Text is the usual text. Just type it in in inspector. Then there's add a silk screen image and you load that in here. Next is a hole, maybe a mounting hole, and you adjust the sizes in inspector. Then we have a via. This is a copper plated hole to connect something in the top layer to the bottom layer. It can go over or under traces. Just put a via either side of the trace, connect your traces to the vias, join your two vias, and select the opposite side of the trace you're crossing. Our trace now goes under the top trace. When selected, the ring and hole diameter is in inspector. Next is a copper pad. This is mainly used as a heat sink for parts. If you want more cooling, you duplicate, send to the bottom layer, put that bottom layer under the top one, then stitch them together with multiple vias. You can also copy and then paste in place when it's selected, then swap it to the bottom. Or duplicate, swap to the bottom. While that's selected, control click the other one. Then it's part, align, align left. Then part, align, align bottom. Pads can also be a general connection point. Just run a trace to the dark orange spot on it. Next is copper fill keep out. If you don't want copper on a part of the PCB. And lastly the copper fill button. This is probably for localised areas because the routing ground fill is more common. Copper keep out is further down and it sets this air gap between parts. Now we'll see how ground fill works. Here we have two headers. One with three ground symbols and three ground net lists and a separate pin with a ground net list. And a second header with every second pin hardwired, also connected to a single pin. I hardwired the second connector in the PCB view to reflect the schematic view but I left the first header rat's nest lines. Now if we go routing, ground fill, there's two types. Copper fill, which fills all empty areas with copper without making a connection to the circuit. Undo. Let's now go routing, ground fill, but ground fill again. And we get a pop-up box about ground seeds. Let's ignore it. And we wind up with exactly the same as copper fill. Undo that. Now let's right click this pin and set ground seed. And go routing, ground fill, ground fill. And now we see little spokes connecting that pin to the ground plane. The little spokes are a thermal barrier so it doesn't suck all the heat out of your soldering iron. What you'll notice, it only connected the netlist pins to the ground plane. Undo that. Now let's set a ground seed on a pin with a ground symbol. Routing, ground fill, ground fill. Now both of those groups have spokes. We'll undo that. We'll now go routing, ground fill, but remove all our ground seeds. Delete all our connecting traces. The rat's nest shows we're still hardwired in schematic. We set a ground seed on our single pin. Routing, ground fill, ground fill top. Our connected pins now connected to the top plane. Basically any net can be joined to a ground fill. We have our connected ground fill plane on top, but let's now put a separate one on the bottom. We have to remove the seed on the other net. So it's routing, ground fill, clear ground fill seeds. Select bottom layer only and this time we'll make a different net a ground seed. Then it's routing, ground fill, and ground fill bottom. Show both layers again. And we still have our top ground fill. And if you look here, you can see our new net is connected to the bottom plane. 
And if you look at a pin on this new net, you can see it has a keep out so it's not connected to the top plane. Auto router. There's only one rule for the auto router, and that's to never use an auto router. Auto routers used to be good in the 70s where there was a lot of aligned ICs with east west traces on one side and north south on the other. But now everything's placed randomly so they don't work very well. Here is a single sided PCB that I manually laid out. Let's see what an auto router can do. It's pretty ugly and it couldn't even do three connections, which is a far cry from doing it manually. Here is another single sided manually laid out board, before and after. I even allowed double sided to help it out. If you don't mind a mess you can patch it up, but it can't do what a human can do. Routing manually takes a lot more time, but it's worth it. If you want to see an expensive $9,000 circuit design program do the same thing, it's EEV blog 975. The last two special buttons are notes. Just select and type what you like. And ruler if you want to check dimensions. To change units, just select in inspector. Next is some dimension tips. If you try to measure the distance between two similar objects from their centers, you can't measure it accurately by eye. So you measure from the edge of one object to the same edge on the other object. For similar objects, this is way more accurate than trying to guess the centers. If you want to use coordinates, the origin of a part is in the top left corner. If we click on the PCB, its coordinates are 0, 0. And if you look down here, there's cursor coordinates. To change units, just click on it. And when you go to the top left corner of the PCB, you can see the cursor coordinates are 0, 0. Now if we move this part with coordinates, and make it 0, 0, but you'll notice the top left corner of the part doesn't exactly go on 0, 0. And that's because it uses the top left corner of the invisible part selection box. And that means if you're moving things mathematically, you'll have to account for the larger selection box. Another feature is, if you grab the PCB and move it, nothing moves with it. Undo that. But if you tick the sticky box when the PCB is selected, everything will move together. To work out track widths for the power you're using, just go online and look for a calculator. If you want a custom trace with two different sizes, make it off the board between two headers, add a bend point and then delete up to bend point, then run a new trace. To cut it free, just add a bend point and delete up to bend point and then do it on the other end. Then just move it where you want. Next is design rules check. And this is dependent on the PCB manufacturer's minimum allowable distances. To select them, go to DRC settings. This sets the allowable gap between parts. It's not documented, but it looks like the minimum allowable gap is 10 thou for all of them. If you look in custom, it shows 10 thou. Next is routing and design rules check. Errors turn red on the PCB. You can also click on a reported error, and that one will highlight on the PCB like this trace. There will also be a lot of reported errors for the same thing. After clicking an error, it's up to you to inspect what's causing it. Here we see a trace touching a hole. A PCB manufacturer might reject this because it's below their minimum distance. You'll have to go to their site to see what's allowed. I etch my own PCBs and will be putting a nylon bolt in there, so I'm going to allow it. Just go through them one by one and decide what's allowable depending on your circumstances. Lastly, we come to checking the design and that is by checking the Gerbers. So it's File, Export, For Production, Extended Gerbers. Make a folder, select and save. The Gerber view I use is the free Gerb V. You go File, Open Layers, Open Folder, then it's click on the last file and drag to the top to select all of them. Then go to Layers and just turn everything off. Then turn on the layer with the most tracks and look for abnormalities and missing parts. Things like missing stuff is a sign the part wasn't made properly in fritzing. Next is a drill layer and that tells you if the holes actually exist and will be drilled. Sometimes fritzing parts have holes shown that don't actually get drilled. Next highlight the other copper layer and check if it's alright. Through old parts and wires are supposed to have a copper pad on the top and bottom. So this is another check if the part was made properly. You might try contour next which shows the outline of the PCB. Then maybe top silk screen and whatever other layer you want to check. Gerb V also has a ruler. Just click, drag and click. Then just read the dimension down here. You can change units here. Fritzing has other exports. There's different image formats for display. More accurate production formats. It can do a bill of materials bomb. This comes out as HTML format that opens in a browser. And we'll probably need their column format changed to buy from electronic warehouses. Other references is the keyboard shortcuts. 
Just go to learning full reference keyboard. Another good one is help, tips and tricks. In Fritzing there's an option to generate a spice net list for simulation, but this feature was never finished so it doesn't work. Fritzing also has an Arduino IDE, and some people say it works, but you're probably better off with the latest version of the official Arduino IDE.